your landscape. I love flowers, but I don't have time to spend hours and hours in my yard. I, my vegetable garden gets more of my attention than my flower beds do. But realistically, think about how much time you're going to be able to spend there and don't design a whole lot of annual beds into it if you're not going to have time to plan and maintain them or if you don't have the help to plan and maintain them. Sometimes it's just kind of a meat and potatoes deal, shrubs and trees. But if you think in the future you're going to want to do with more color and things like that, allow room for that before you get started. I think you will find as you drive around and look at landscapes that one of the things that attracts you most about a landscape is color. And I would always allow at least some area. I mean, if you have a bed that's this big around, anybody can find the time to plant that with pansies and cabbage or whatever else in the winter, or periwinkles or zinnias or whatever else in the summer. But um, as one of our former extension agents said, and I think it was one of the few intelligent things he ever said, he said, you can always judge the success of your colored planting in your yard by the number of tire marks on the curb where people have run off the street trying to see what it is that you have planted. I've stopped and backed up and gone around the block to go back and look at things. As we were driving uh, from Love Field into Dallas for a convention last year, going along Mockingbird Lane or one of those places, just out of the corner of your eye, you think, man, what is that? And so we had to go around, drive around the block two times just to see it, and then decide we had to get out and take some pictures of it because it was such a spectacular landscape. And the thing that made it so beautiful was that they had used a large number of tropical plants, which are not going to survive in Dallas over the winter, but obviously for these people it was a reasonable investment to them. And it was filled with crotons and all sorts of things you would normally not expect to see. It looked like you were in the middle of the Caribbean, and it was absolutely spectacular. But again, think about whether this is the sort of thing that you want to maintain and whether or not, you know, financially it's, it's doable for you. I personally get, not offended, but just amused by people that come in. My chai this morning was, what, $4.17 or something like that. People will come in with a $4 cup of Starbucks coffee in their hand, pick up a $1.50 plant and say, is this going to die this winter? And I say, yes, and they put it back. They say, well, I'm not going to get it if it's not perennial. Sip, sip on the coffee, throw the cup away. Keep your priorities in mind. If you enjoy what you're doing and you spend 100 bucks on crotons and tropical plants and they freeze this winter, so be it. You probably blew that much money on one good dinner somewhere else or maybe a whole lot more. Years ago, there was a fellow, I won't mention him by name, uh, lived a few blocks from here, and he came in, uh, and what did he tell me he wanted to order? I think 24 dwarf hibiscus. I said, Stanley, you realize these things are, I don't know, whatever they were, 10 bucks a piece or whatever, and I said, you realize these things are going to freeze and die this winter? He said, I don't care. If I get eight months' worth of pleasure out of it, that's fine, and I can afford it. His wife told me later it was the neatest thing it ever done. I mean, it was the street not too far from here, and I drove up and down it because every morning there'd be probably 150 big old beautiful tropical flowers out there. She said everybody that drove by came up and knocked on the door to ask what it was and said he just you'd see him just bursting with pride every time he went out to explain to people that was the best 150 bucks he ever spent. But these are things that you keep in mind as you're doing your landscape planning. Uh, again, if you're dealing with a small yard and you want to create the uh, appearance of more space, don't plant any big shrubs into it. Again, we're not going to talk plant varieties, but don't draw, you know, in mind visualizing some giant things on the corner of the house or something like that. No, you don't want to do that. If you've got a small yard, you want to have more plants and smaller plants if you want to create the illusion of more space. Again, I've seen yards that were no bigger than this that you could almost totally fill them up with six or eight plants. And that's the last thing you want to do when you're dealing with a small area. By the same token, the person that's sitting on several acres, the house is sitting 300 feet back from the street or whatever, if you want to create more curb appeal, and some people do that, I mean, I want to be as far away from the street as possible and have as few people able to look at it as possible. But if you want to draw something you know, to you visually, you put a straight line in between there. Uh, you do just the opposite when it comes to choosing plant sizes. You use fewer but much larger plants. I mean, if that house is sitting 300 feet back from the street and you plant the same thing you're going to put into a small landscape, you want to be able to see it. 
Uh, but on the other hand, that's the place you use the big full plants, the showy flowering shrubs or trees or whatever else. And unfortunately, there may be plants that you just have to X off the list. And that's why I say don't start thinking plant varieties right now. Because you say, well, gosh, I absolutely love Basham's Party Paint Crepe Myrtle, and I'm going to have one. That thing's going to grow 30 feet tall and 10 feet wide. If you've got a small landscape, there's no place for it. So you're going to have to adapt your plant selection later on to some extent when you do your landscaping. But right now, when you're drawing it in, when you're going to put a spot and say big shrub, small shrub, whatever else, you know, don't do that. When you're dealing with a small area, you're going to deal with smaller plants. Choice of materials to use in the landscape uh, as far as hardscape. Uh, just a few um, unrelated notes that uh, I will tell you. If it's getting really hot, you want me to turn this fan on and see if we can do it low? Okay, that is a pretty strong response. Hang on just a second. We don't have all these things tied into the main box yet, but we can't put an extension cord on it and have it plugged it in here. Anyway, materials, just in no particular order, if you're going to use brick in the landscape, and a lot of people like to use brick, 98% of the time, my suggestion is don't. The the biggest problem with brick these days is the majority of brick out there comes out of Mexico and it is very poorly fired. Uh, I saw an older gentleman absolutely heartbroken. In fact, I think it's what led to his early death, actually. Uh, but he had spent a year and I don't know how many thousands of dollars building immense areas of uh, brick deck and building all of his planter boxes out of brick and things like that that matched his home. And it was absolutely gorgeous the day that he got through with it. Well, one big problem with the soft brick, which is what, again, probably 98% of the brick that's used in this town is, that when we get a lot of moisture, the bricks will absorb the moisture. And then guess what happens if we have a hard freeze? They explode. And we've seen that even with some of our old hard brick here. If they get a little bit porous, we get a hard freeze when that brick is wet. And literally, that brick that is this size turns into 10,000 little pieces that are no bigger than this. And Harvey's whole backyard, it, it was just a mass of crumbled bricks. The, uh, you know, all the beds were falling apart. Uh, and again, just one hard freeze with moist brick. And if you've got the soft brick, you have a just an immense problem. If you have to have brick, be sure that it is a really hard brick. The Hanna still makes pretty good bricks. The bricks in our sidewalks were torn out of the old Callahan building that were, they're probably 100 year old bricks. And sometimes you can find antique hard brick. And in my opinion, that is fine to use in the landscape. But the great majority of the brick that you get is going to be a soft material. It should never be put in contact with the ground. Um, the best material to use if you want something that looks like brick are some of the new concrete pavers. And they make concrete that looks very much like brick. There's a place down, uh, not too far from the Alamo building called the Huntley, that's Alamo concrete tile or pavers or something like that. They have some different shapes, there's a variety of color. And a lot of the material, again, is brick shaped and looks like brick. I think it is ideal materials in landscape, but stay away from brick. Now you say, well, I've got these brick and I just want to use a few of them. How do they're acceptable? Throw them in a bucket of water. Let them sit there for two or three days. And then take a hard nail and see if you can scratch them. If you can scratch them, if you could etch into them, if you can carve your initials into them or whatever kids used to do, that brick is, should not ever, ever be used. The other thing you can do if you want to be really scientific is weigh the brick before you put it in the water. Take it out, dry it off with a towel, and weigh it again. If it weighs virtually any more than it did to 